Welcome back to Module 2. In this video, we're going to be talking about solar and lunar eclipses. This focuses on one single section out of OpenStax Astronomy 2E in Chapter 4, and we're going to be comparing these two different types of phenomena. Now, one of the biggest obstacles that we have to overcome in our understanding is to recognize that the diagrams that we see are really limited by the fact that they have to fit on a flat piece of paper. That means that the scale is totally um, out of alignment and all of the diagrams we see are two-dimensional, they're flat. That tricks us to think that everything orbits in the same plane and that isn't the case. Really important for our understanding of this topic is the realization that the moon's orbit around the Earth is tilted about five degrees with respect to the Earth's orbit around the sun, which means it's five degrees offset from the ecliptic, the path that the sun appears to make through our sky that we've seen in star charts and previous diagrams. These two paths, the sun's path through our sky as seen from Earth and the moon's physical path through the sky, they cross twice a year at what are called nodes, an ascending node and a descending node. We just need to keep an eye on this idea of nodes being important to eclipses. So if we're going to have a chance to see these all lined up with each other, it will have to be at one of these two special points, which only happens twice a year. What else do we need? We need the shadows to be in the right place and the right size. So an important thing for us to recognize about shadows, relevant to both solar eclipses and to lunar eclipses, are that shadows actually have two different parts. If you are looking at the shadow from a single point source, there is an extra dark part where all of that light source is being covered up from your point of view. In this diagram, the location one, labeled one out of one, two, three, four, is the only place where you would be um, unable to see any part of the sun. That would be the umbra, the extra dark part of the shadow. If you're offset, so at locations two or three, you're not even lined up properly with the sun uh, in the back of the shadow, you'll see a partial shadow. Part of the sun is being covered up, which means you're getting less light than you would have otherwise, and you will have a partial shadow called the penumbra. And a third possibility so you're um, lined up right behind the object and you're in the umbra, you're offset and you have partial uh, coverage, that's the penumbra. The penumbra also extends backwards. If you're far enough away from the object causing the shadow, you'll still see the sun all around the outside of it. In location four here, we see that. That's going to be relevant to our discussion of the last type of solar eclipse coming up, but that again tells us that the umbra, the extra dark part, is actually only a single cone and it does not extend um, all the way out uh, in distance. Now, the important part for us to recognize is that solar eclipses on Earth are actually remarkably cool and unique to our Earth and Moon system. The moon is surprisingly big compared to our planet, and it's remarkably close to us compared to all of the locations it could be. What that ends up meaning is that when we think about just how much of our view from horizon to horizon the sun and the moon take up, they each have the same um, overall angle size. This idea of angular size is really important for us to distinguish between physical size. The sun is larger than the moon by about a factor of 400, but the sun is also farther away, so it looks small. In the same way that if you saw a car down the road um, and you held up a little toy car near your face, they could look like they take up about the same amount of um, your vision. That would be angular size. This is pure coincidence. Unlike tidal locking, this is something that we don't anticipate and we're just quite lucky to have. Uh, and this half a degree of size that each of these objects are um, is only some of the time. On the diagram here on the left, when we physically are closest to the sun in January of every year, uh, the sun looks a little bit bigger. And when we're farthest away from the sun, the sun looks a little bit smaller. The moon's orbit is a lot more um, elliptical than the Earth's is, so the supermoon is when we're extra close to the moon. The moon is at its closest point to us, uh, and that's about a 20% 
um, increase compared to the smallest the moon can get, or a micromoon. And on this note, I do want to point out this idea of angular size is one that we can use in everyday nighttime observing. If you hold your pink, pinky finger up um, at the full extent of your arm, your pink, pinky finger takes up um, a degree of angular size if you have it fully extended away from you. People with longer arms tend to have larger pinkies, and so it always ends up being about one uh, degree for, for all humans. If you hold up your fist, again, at full uh, outstretched, then the width of it becomes 10 degrees in your view. And if you um, extend your thumb and your pinky as far apart as you can, and again, hold it fully extended, that's about a 25 degree angular size. And you can check this, that's about how far across the Big Dipper asterism is. Uh, so the next time you're out and you look for it, you can just uh, hold up and, and uh, check for yourself. Now, when we have the sun, moon, and earth all lined up like this, if we look at this diagram, we can see that the earth is casting a long shadow away from the sun, and the moon is casting a long shadow away from the sun. And this alignment allows us to have the moon's shadow fall on the earth. Now, I want you to pause for as long as it takes to decide what moon phase would we be seeing on Earth, or what would we be expecting in our moon phase calendars for this situation to occur? Can it be any phase, or does it have to be one specific phase? Pause if you need to. All right, now we have seen this kind of alignment in our moon phase topic, and this would be a new moon. So for us to get the moon's shadow on the Earth during the day, the moon would have to be in a new moon phase and fully cover up the sun. Now this happened twice recently in um, August of 2017, where it went from uh, Oregon and Washington down through uh, Georgia and South Carolina. And it happened very recently, um, I'm recording this a couple of weeks after, it happened very recently in April of 2024, where it started in Mexico and went all the way up through Maine and Canada. Now, I was very lucky um, to be able to see both of these total eclipses. Back in 2017, my whole family descended upon my great aunt's house. This is me, uh, a picture of me in her front yard. Uh, and we just all made it a family reunion for the weekend to be able to see the eclipse uh, in totality. And you'll see a couple of photos from that event in just a little bit. And I was able to go again with uh, my, my family in uh, the San Antonio area, and although it was a little bit cloudier, we did get to see the whole uh, partial eclipse going into totality, and we got to see all of totality before the clouds really rolled in on us. So we got very lucky, and I'm, I'm very grateful for those opportunities. Now, if you were able to observe either of those eclipses from the Grand Rapids area, you would have seen a partial eclipse. And the safest way to have done that would be to use a pinhole camera. So either um, sticking a pin in a piece of cardboard and holding that up, or creative uses of uh, either existing pinhole cameras like a colander or sieve that has all these different holes. That's the picture I took on the left back in 2017 or natural pinhole cameras, the small amounts of light that filter in between leaves, each one acts like a pinhole camera and the shadows that you see then become very feathery. And if you look closely at the image on the right, every single one of those bits of light is now projecting the um, crescent of a partial eclipse. Now these are the pictures that I took with a camera and a filter during the partial eclipse as we were going into the 2017 uh, eclipse. And on the far left uh, picture, you can actually see that there are multiple sunspot groups. We're going to be learning about sunspots when we learn more about the sun, but those small dark spots on the surface of the sun itself are real features that you get to see um, with the safety of a solar telescope or solar binoculars. In each one of these, the moon is kind of progressing on its path to be able to cover up the sun, uh, and all of these would be uh, related to what you could have seen in 2017 or in 2024 from the Grand Rapids area or greater West Michigan area. 
But thankfully, because of um, the, uh, the hospitality of my great aunt, we were able to see totality in Gallatin, Tennessee um, for almost three minutes. And these two pictures are, um, again, just from a point and click camera uh, without a filter this time. This is really how dark the sky looked and it was a remarkable experience. It was so um, interesting and rewarding that we made a big trek yet again um, for the 2024 eclipse. Uh, and we all traveled together to San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and my dad got us matching t-shirts. So I, I love this photo. Um, I'll include it here with all of us uh, at a rest area along the highway uh, in Texas, where we had a picnic table and games and uh, food and we just chilled there all day uh, waiting for the partial eclipse. And then this image on the right is from my sister. Um, she took that with her cell phone. Um, and the really interesting part of this picture here is if you look along the edges of the sun, on the right side, there's kind of um, two bright pinkish points. And on the left, although it's harder to tell, there's another pinkish point. Those show up in the like uh, fully professional photography also. Those are all features on the sun's surface that normally would be um, overshadowed by the bright normal uh, sun itself. But when the moon covers them up, they show up in this bright pinkish color because of the type of um, elements that we're seeing here. And this is actually how the sun was first studied way back hundreds of years ago when we didn't have satellites to be able to study these special um, prominences or the the structures that we're seeing here astronomers had to actually wait for an eclipse or travel around the world to see eclipses and hope for the best hope that they had clear weather now if the moon is not near the um, earth not near its closest point we saw that picture at the very beginning of the different angular size values it might not be close enough that the umbra of its shadow actually reaches the Earth. There are situations, different years, um, where the, the best solar eclipse that we're going to have that year is actually called an annular solar eclipse because the shadow that's falling on the Earth is just the penumbra part. It's too far away from us to get that extra dark umbra cone shadow. So this is a set of images from 2012. Um, and uh, what's important to note here is, again, you get to see these sunspot groups, uh, quite impressive on the partial uh, eclipses. And when all of the alignment is perfect, we still don't get that remarkable um, shining that you saw on the previous sets of images, uh, which is actually the sun's corona that we'll learn more about uh, in several weeks. The key thing with an annular solar eclipse is it's not about being in the wrong place no one on the globe would be able to observe totality because the shadow simply is not reaching our planet. So let's summarize solar eclipses. They're, they're the ones that are um, much rarer and a little bit harder to kind of wrap our brains around. So I want to make sure that we feel comfortable with it. There are three required conditions if we want to see um, a solar eclipse. First, the moon has to be at a node in its orbit. We started with that at the beginning of the video, where there's only twice a year um, where that would work. And for a solar eclipse, it needs to be the exact crossing. So there really are only two days out of the year where there's a chance. And that is often called eclipse season. And then the moon has to be in the new moon phase at that moment. So that's once every month. But if the 12 months that we have available to us, or maybe 13 total new moons we have in a year, if none of those are happening when a node is happening, then we will not get, um, we will not get a solar eclipse. And then to be able to actually see it, you have to travel. You have to be in the narrow path of totality or the slightly wider path of the partial eclipse, where for both the 2017 and 2024 eclipses, it was really only um, North America that had any chance of seeing any part of that eclipse, whether partial or total. Our textbook has an appendix of upcoming eclipses, so if you're curious, you can always see what's nearby um, and 
you may hear, um, especially in the, the lead up and um, weeks after the 2024 eclipse, there's a lot of news stories coming out in the U.S. saying that the next eclipse is 2044 or 2045. Um, I want to be very clear that that's the next one that you could see without a passport. Um, there are between zero and two every single year, um, and 2026 is going to have one that crosses through Iceland and Spain. So keep your eyes peeled, look at the appendix, um, and if you're really interested in trying to plan ahead, uh, definitely talk with me. Now let's talk about lunar eclipses. Our discussion is going to be a little bit shorter because they're easier to understand and they're also easier to see. So the diagram here on the left shows us that in order to have a lunar eclipse, because the Earth's shadow is much bigger um, as a target, we have a lot more wiggle room around the node points and so we're much more likely to be able to have a lunar eclipse, either total, if we go all the way through the extra dark part of Earth's shadow, the umbra, or a partial, if we go partially through that extra dark part or just through the penumbra. So we still have to be near a node, but then important, if we think back to that previous picture, Earth's shadow is extending away from the sun, which means for us to be able to see it, there has to be a really bright full moon that isn't in any shadow normally, but happens to go through this target that's always there projected into the darkness of space, and then we'll get a lunar eclipse. And the gif here on the right that you've probably been watching instead of watching me, I hope so at least, it's much more interesting, uh, shows the overall process of a lunar eclipse. And you can see that circular shadow and the way that the the moon moves through it and we actually get this really interesting effect when we are fully in the extra dark shadow the umbra then we get this reddish color that is the same reason we get reddish um, color around sunset and sunrise it's filtered sunlight that's actually going around the edges of earth's atmosphere and illuminating the moon with this very faint red glow which is quite cool one of the most important things that I want to convey here, especially because we talked so much about moon phases over two separate um, lecture section videos, um, is that when we are talking about a lunar eclipse, we see shapes that are simply not part of our monthly moon phases. So if we look on the right two images, the far right image we've actually seen before, it's the picture I took of the waxing gibbous moon um, that we asked questions and answered questions about in the predicting moon phases section. And this middle image here, so um, second from the right, is a snapshot from a lunar eclipse. And you can see that the part of the moon that is lit up has a different shape to it entirely. And that partial shadow from the lunar eclipse is not a gibbous shape, and it is not a crescent shape either, not really, because we're getting this kind of bite out of a cookie shape instead that is typical of lunar eclipses, but will never happen for the standard um, phases of the moon every month. It may be worth pausing so that you can draw a clear diagram for yourself or really kind of hit home this this difference for yourself, because I want you to be able to convince yourself through these images that lunar eclipses and Earth shadow are playing a role for a specific event and not for the monthly phases. And then to wrap up this topic, uh, because it is, it is one that doesn't take too much explaining, but it is something that you'll want to mull over. I really love this tweet from um, Dr. Katie Mack. Uh, she's an astronomer. She's written a couple of really excellent um, books for popular science. And uh, the emoji that she tweeted out uh, several years ago uh, does a great job of summarizing the alignment that you would need for a lunar eclipse, the alignment you would need for a solar eclipse, and as we transition into our topic of the solar system and scale, we'll start to recognize that there's not even space to put the sun in between the Earth and the moon, uh, and so we get the amusing punchline of the joke of that would truly be an apocalypse. There's a linked two-minute video that has good animations of eclipses, uh, and that will wrap up the topic for us. If you have any questions, make sure to check in with me. Thanks for watching.